you're, this gym is very much a CrossFit focused gym. And you see all sorts of good and bad things said about CrossFit. And the good and bad things said about bodybuilding. I think it'd be a great parallel to find out where we meet in the middle. My insecurity was that I was always the smallest kid. Yeah. I, ha- I, I don't have struggled to make friends, but I've struggled to keep friends. Hold on, everyone should be able to squat as the grass because they use the baby analogy for getting the babies have overly gigantic heads and never move away from the centre of mass. But you also got the, you, the, the sometimes the exercise mechanic model has to wrap people in a bubble wrap and go, but it could be structured, we don't have an x-ray, let's just work around it. This yeah. is why coaching is so individualised, right? Because if you've got someone and you've got 12 week transformation, they've signed up for, you've got 12 weeks. And like that's a very different story to the person who's coming to you and saying, I want a lifetime of change. Hello and welcome to the South Made Podcast. And this is a very special episode of the show as I go down to Fortress Hill here in Hong Kong to speak to Ed Hones, owner of Coastal Fitness and owner of The Process Programming, a CrossFit gym that has worked with many, many CrossFit athletes for the CrossFit Games, with Ant, Ed's brother, being very, very successful at the sport. We thought it'd be an interesting discussion to talk about bodybuilding versus CrossFit, the similarities, the differences, and how we program these for our athletes. I have been in the industry 12 years working with body composition and bodybuilding clients, and Ed has worked primarily with CrossFit guys. And you've probably all heard horror stories from both modalities, the jacked up, tight, airheaded bodybuilders versus the horror stories of the crazy workers of CrossFit. But Ed thinks a little bit differently. He thinks long term. And in this episode, we talk about things like periodization, how to plan for the long term with these athletes, and where bodybuilding style training actually comes in. We talk our backgrounds, how we got into being educators in the industry, and how thing people like Charles Pollock, Exercise Mechanics, RTS, and more has influenced our decision making in our career, and how we've learned to change our minds on things. This is truly a fascinating conversation, and it's a two-part episode that I encourage you to download both parts. If you enjoy the show, please share on social media. We'd like to get this episode out to as many people as possible and to grow the show as it comes close to its third year. And if you want to follow me for at me at Kingsley Dutton on Instagram or Simon Kingsley Dutton on YouTube, if you're watching this already, click subscribe down below. And um, follow Ed at Ed underscore Haynes on Instagram and the Process Programming and Coastal Fitness HK to find out more about him, his programming style, his CrossFit games, and what his gym is up to. And I'll leave you with myself and Ed Haynes. Simon, you reached out to me, Simon. <laughs> I've, I've definitely seen you in this space for quite a while um, through social media. I know you're doing some great stuff in coaching. You reached out to me and asked if I could be on your podcast. Then we had a bit back and forth about trying to find a good place to do the podcast. And then I suggested, why don't you come here we do the podcast, you know, with with the process set up, and then we're going to have two audio files that we can push over at once. But essentially, you're going to run this podcast, and we have a bit of a back and forth mm. on training, life, coaching, a bit of everything. Who knows where we'll go? I think I think the best podcasts always end up on the best tangents. I agree. But yeah, thank thank you for showing up. This is an incredible space. Like I'm, I've been in Hong Kong four years now. And I'm used to being able to stretch my arms out and touch two sides of the wall. So to have something that's two floors is quite impressive. <laughs> well, thank you very much, mate. Tell, cool. us, tell us about yourself, mate, but before we get into the questions, like, what are you doing here? What do you do? Um, so, yeah, so, for, for, as, as you said, my name's Simon Dunn. I've been in the fitness industry now 12 years, probably almost 13. I am very much an old, grumpy man. Like, you know, the, the, the guy saying back in my day, and that is, that is me in the fitness industry now. So, I've spent the last 10 years working at some of the world's biggest PT companies, running education for UK, running the company, you know, education for Asia, and working with people getting mainly body composition results. So coming through the Polygon setup, coming through the UP setup, and help people get, regular people get jaw dropping transformations. And I built this sort of reputation for myself with getting results with all the people that people couldn't get results with. So I, mean, I had this running joke where I used to work that, if like a, a beautiful, gorgeous model came in, she would go to Luke, like our pretty boy in the gym. If we had like this big jack guy, it would go to my colleague Matt. If someone came in dragging their foot, diabetic needle in their arm, I heard veganism t-shirts, you know full well it was going to me. <laughs> but doing that for thousands and thousands of hours, it, it gave me tons of tools that I think I probably had about five years experience in the first year. And I always had this desire to learn. I always thought, right, I want, if I study now, I'm going to plan for being the coach I am in five years, ten years, rather than thinking now. And that's kind of went into my, my love of education. Um, and as, as we said you know, before going on air, I always think there's a certain type of mentality that people that go into the education part of this process that I think they're a little bit... People get into the fitness industry because they're insecure. And I think that people who go into education in the fitness industry also have that little bit of a chip on the shoulder. And I think, I think for me... 
growing up was as an only child, bullied at school. I always wanted to be heard, always wanted to be sort of like, not centre of attention, but just wanted to be respected. And I think that always pushed me of like, having a little bit of imposter syndrome, which a lot of people consider as a bad thing, um, it's actually the thing that's, if I didn't have that, I would have spent the amount of money I spent on education. I wouldn't have got some mentoring. I wouldn't have come to Hong Kong. Um, and so now what I essentially do for most of my career, both at Hit PT here in Hong Kong, and the line is help coaches beat imposter syndrome by improving their client results. So the mentorship, I went a little bit different to your other kind of education courses where yes, we have our syllabus, but I'm not just talking about thermodynamics and nutrition plans and training programs. I'm actually one-to-one -one working with all these coaches. So they get a one-to-one -one call me every month, and obviously the guys here get this every week, to actually help hands-on make them better on the gym floor with their clientele. And you know, I was, as you're saying that I'll run this, this one, I was quite excited coming out, I was saying to you off there that Hong Kong is an emerging fitness market, but it's rare to see people that are nerdy on programming. And what I liked about the idea of this conversation was your, this gym is very much a CrossFit focused gym. I mean, you see all sorts of good and bad things said about CrossFit and good and bad things said about bodybuilding. And I think it'd be a great parallel to find out where we meet in the middle and find out where we disagree. And I think that'd be a really interesting discussion. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited. I'm really excited about the conversation as well. And I think we'll find a lot of common ground in where we both started in this industry mm. uh, in terms of our education, our mentors. I Actually, before we even get into that, I wanted to ask you a bit more about your story. Yeah. And so tell me a bit more about this insecure this insecure younger you who decided to get into coaching? I mean, this is something like I've always, I've always found that I struggle to make deep connections with people. And I think I had this thing in my life where I, ha I, I don't have struggle to make friends, but I've struggled to keep friends. And it's, looking back realistically, it's like when you're on Instagram and you see that the one negative comment's the thing that actually sticks out. Mm. Like I, I have some great friends throughout my life, but I've, I've focused on those sorts of like things. And, it's only really recently actually starting um, therapy with a company called Total Mental Performance, which is definitely worth a great shout out because they are therapists and performance coaches. But I've actually started to delve into some of these insecurities. And I think with me, a lot of this spawned from, like probably like most kids against the fitness industry, is the inability to chat with women. Mm. Like absolutely terrible at it. Um, not having the confidence. And because of that, I built up this process in my head that when I talk to people, I'm not, I'm not confident or... Uh, I'm not charismatic enough, I can't hold a conversation. And I think a lot of that then was the pursuit of like, how do I make myself stand out more? And it starts off with learning a little bit about how to talk to people, improve my communication skills, getting out there more. But then it kind of morphed into, I got into the gym and I was like, this is something I have control of. And I, I suppose that element of, when people say control is not really a healthy thing, but I think I kind of hooked onto that. I can control a little bit of the path of my life here by how I go about doing the gym. And that's probably why I'm now, my approach is very systems-based. It's why I love programming. It's the reason probably why I like a, like a Google spreadsheet. Because it's like, how do I create as much control and systemize as much of this as possible? Um, I kind of drawn on a tangent from your question, but I kind of hope that kind of answers a little bit of that. No, it does. What, what age are we talking here? What point did you start taking ownership of this, of this insecurity of yours? And I think as well, like, you know, you, you're talking about your insecurity, like you've obviously done some reflecting on it. Yeah, and you have more clarity on it. Um, is that something, did you go to this, these therapists that you work with now with that intention of trying to uncover it or was that something that emerged throughout your conversations? A <sighs> little bit of both. I think I was always had this thing, I was like, I almost went through like two yearly cycles with certain groups of mates and I was like, well, I know I'm friends with these people but why am I the one lower on the invite list? And I always had that frustration of like, Right, why do some people find it so easy to make these connections? Well, I have to work hard all the time. So I kind of had a rough idea, but I didn't know where this came from. And it's only when I kind of went into the sort of like the therapy room, I mean, kind of did the thing where you have to, I don't know if you've ever done therapy, but you have to go over into, like, imagine you're over your timeline of your life, yeah. and you go back all the way until what's the earliest thing you can remember. And I remember, like, the first person I ever told I fancy is laughed in my face. I remember the times getting bullied in year six. And like, I started looking at all these all these moments and like now, probably if something like this happened to me at 30, while I would get an emotional response to it, I'm wise enough, hopefully, to be able to have a bit of perspective. You don't realize how much these things actually affect your psyche. Like I've, you know, only child, so probably that, that hasn't helped things, but I have. I've got great parents, I've been very, very lucky. I've not come from extreme poverty, you know, not been mega rich either, but like it's, 
I don't have anything on the surface. I go, that's my issue. And there's nothing, I don't think, touch wood, that I would go into an ayahuasca ceremony thinking it's going to come up, it's going to ruin my life. But all these little things, whether it's whatever your trauma is, it may not have to be a big thing. It's not, it's not abuse. It's not getting beaten up. It's not violence. It could just be something as simple as failing to make connections that actually just carry with you. Um, and I think that's what I found is going through this therapy process is just having, being able to have a little bit of perspective on it. I'm able to see it a little bit more from where that one, one could have taken me. Um, and two, just understanding like, now, if I had that opportunity again, I would have looked at that whole thing differently. And it isn't actually maybe as much to do with me as I thought it was. So what would you, how would you look at it differently? But now? Yeah. Um, I think it's just a more of a greater awareness of realising that the things that people do to me probably aren't anything to do with me. Like, p- people will be so much more free when they realise how people... Are we good to swear on this podcast? Is this a swearing podcast or not? Am I censored? Out. Oh. I was. I will, I will. I will say no in this time. Right? That's good. I'll <laughs> say no the time. Back. I do remember. I'll say recently. She tried to stop swearing. Cool. Yeah. Like, I think you. It's how freeing it is when you realise how people don't care about you as much as you think they do. Yes. And for so long, when like if you're not invited to something, or it, it may mean nothing to do with what you are. Like I had an issue recently where I had a group of mates that like I wasn't invited to stuff as much as the others, and I looked at it and like, what is it to do with me? Why are I the person that is charismatic or interesting enough to be on the invite list? Or it could be the fact that these boys are going on lads' holidays to meet loads of women and I've been engaged for, like, I've been in a relationship for nine years. I don't fit that mould. But I would have looked at it a year ago as my problem. What is it about me? Well, I'm actually like, okay, well, maybe it's just happy to be texting this person, do you want to go for lunch? And I would not look at it like that. I wouldn't look at it as a spontaneous thing. So I think it's just realising that actually people don't actually care about you as much as you think. And that's actually quite a nice feeling. Can I, can I ask, you know, becoming a coach... Hmm and thinking that it was going to fix the problem of you struggling to create deep relationships and have good friendships. Yeah. Did that actually achieve and fix the problem? My initial reaction was no. But I think think it's more complicated than that. I think, in its essence, no, it hasn't. Like, I still have have issues. I still have insecurity. I still have imposter syndrome. I still, like, we, we look in the mirror and we always see the worst parts of ourselves, right? So, whereas it might have been how small I was 10, 15 years ago, and now it's my teeth. But I'll always find the worst stuff. Mm. And other people won't care about it as much. But on the flip side, me having at least bouts, especially when I've gone and got incredibly lean, of being more confident in my appearance, or the very least thinking it, I, it, I'm, I'm a walking advertisement for what I do, gave me a little bit of a, a positive chip on my shoulders, like, cool, I know what I'm doing. And that alone maybe made me take more opportunities, go out there more, speak to people more, that in turn has helped me overcome that. Like, as we said, like we, we, this is half my podcast, half your podcast this time. I'm 122 episodes into my podcast. Would I have done this if I'd never gotten in shape or never gone into training? No, because that insecurity of may have only got me into the gym, but the thing that got that, me getting into the gym has now translated into 12 years of being dedicated to this craft and learning more and finding mentors and speaking to people. And that's now given me enough of a network to have a podcast with some crazy, you know, amazing individuals like Jordan Shallow, Pat Davidson, Cassim Hansen, and a, you know, a laundry list of amazing people in the fitness industry. So indirectly, it probably has. Mm. If, I, if I decided to become an accountant, would any of this stuff ever happen? Yeah. I'm a very bad accountant. Well. Interesting. I'm reflecting on thinking... Thinking about my insecure story that got me into coaching, and I've talked about this before, but I've actually been reflecting on it quite a lot more recently um, because it came up in a conversation with our team. And my insecurity was that I was always the smallest kid. And it was like, really, the the poignant memories are always end of year school photos, and I'd always be on the front row, and I'd always be like little gags. And they would, I wouldn't really call it outright bullying, but there was always a joke that Ed would be on the front row. Because it'd always be like, who's the shortest in the class? And it'd be like, well, Ed, there you go. And then, you know, moving into sport, like under 14s, rugby, um, you know, moving, getting potential call up for the Hong Kong team, you're Ed, you're too small. I was always playing an age group up. So Ed, you're going to be in the team, but you're not going to start this year. It's okay, going right. bigger. Right, so always in sport, I was always the smallest. I was the smallest in school. And then it was when I was about 15, I was going on a summer holiday with my family to America. 
and we're going to be traveling around for about a month. And I said, this is the summer I'm going to come back and I'm going to turn some heads with the way that I look. I'm no longer going to be the small kid anymore. And I just started working out every day, just men's health magazines. It was just, I didn't have a gym. Uh, we had a couple of gyms, but I was basically just doing push-ups, dips, pull-ups, sit-ups, definitely no legs, but every single day. <laughs> and, uh, and my diet regimen was have to eat a steak every day and it was a Caesar salad for dinner and an apple for a snack. That's all I had. But I came back and I looked... I started wearing t-shirts that were way tighter. And that's how all I was looking for was confirmation that I was changing. Yeah. And that was basically feeling the insecurity of being a small kid. And I masked that as, no, I'm just training for sport. I'm just training to be a better rugby player. But deep down, actually rugby was very secondary. And the primary focus and driver for my training was to look bigger so I was no longer a small kid. How that grew when I got to 18 was like, I then got shit scared of ever being ID'd at the door. Because so for me, getting asked for ID meant that you look young. And, there, and I translated that as you look small and you, look, you don't look like a man. And so then I had a huge insecurity about going out. And the scariest part of the night out for me was walking into a bar or club and potentially getting asked for ID. Mm -hmm. And then so <clears throat> what... How that eventually led to me finding a fitness career, I don't think actually insecurity got me here, but the insecurity created an, a very deep interest in training and health and wellness, all for my own selfish reasons. How do I get bigger? How do I get stronger? Um, how do I achieve all these physical changes in the way that I look? And then the deeper and deeper I got, I then started wanting to help other people, perhaps on similar journeys, but I also had all this knowledge of how to do it, because I kind of taken myself through a transformation in my early teen years, and I was like, I think I can actually take this knowledge and maybe start passing on to other people. And then I started trying that. So I was like, this is my thing. Like, this is what I want to be doing now. Um, but I would be lying if I said that that insecurity of being small and not being seen to be strong and masculine still exists in the back of my head. And I do a lot of digging into it a lot, very, very, um, very frequently. And now it's more noticing the triggers and the feelings when they come, and to know that this is probably going to be a part of me for the rest of my life. Like, it probably will be. It's probably what's going to keep me working out hard until the day that I die. Um, but every day I'm developing a better relationship with that insecurity and getting better at noticing when the triggers come and then knowing, okay, how do I want to respond? If I respond this way, I'm feeling the insecurity. If I respond this way, then I'm moving away from that insecurity. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree with that. Like, similar thing with my experience, I had a little bit of a relapse with that over the course of the last weekend, and it was like, the, but it felt different this time. Mm. It was just, okay, this is what it is, I can sit with it. Like, like every, every emotion that you have, like happiness, sadness, everything, and you can say the same thing with diet and with regards to hunger sometimes, everything's an emotion. It's going to come and go. And I think people, we are now in a world that people are seeking discomfort more often because the world's gotten so comfortable. If we want to watch something, there's a million things on Netflix. If we want to, um, you know, some food, we can get on Deliveroo. So now, things like, imagine going on Dragon's Den five years ago and saying, I've got this idea, we're going to get a bathtub, we're going to fill it full of ice and you're going to jump in it. Or, you know, we're going to get into a big bathtub and dark, close the room, you're going to sit in there for an hour with no music. Like, you, you'd say I'm out immediately, but people are wanting and needing these, like, discomfort moments to sort of, like, shock them out of things. And I think, um, Going back to what you were saying before, I don't think it's that bad to have a selfish goal. I think sometimes people make things, make them feel worse because they feel that their ambitions have to be totally altruistic. I think your selfish goal, as long as it aligns with other people's goals, that's, that's like, if well, I think, someone I think, says that they don't want to win this for money, at all, like, I love helping, I am not a money-driven guy, whatsoever. But I also, there's something that George Shallow said to me that really stuck. He went, if I charge more for my products, that allows me more time, to help somebody out for free. Yeah. But the person that can't afford me, you couldn't afford the cheaper program either. Yeah. You know, and I think it's like a, you have to be a little bit selfish if you actually want to help as many people as you want to. Yeah. Well, I, I think I think the selfish part of my own journey is, is still wanting, like, you know, I think about health optimization every single day. And I think about myself first and foremost. Mm. So I'm constantly looking, like a lot of my own learning has been for very selfish reasons. It's like, how can I, how can I upgrade as a human being? Uh, and for other people, you know, I don't, like you said, I don't think it's a bad thing. Like, the more they can resonate with you in your journey, and if you can be open and honest and own it, mm. to be like, you know, I'm actually using myself as a, as a constant guinea pig in experimentation. Like, 
you don't want to be a part of that as well, you know. I know, I know our field is helping people get bigger, stronger, more, and in your case, performance orientated as well. But going back to your insecurity about being wanting to be seen as bigger, not wanting to be the small guy, if someone had that problem now and he wants to do a quick fix, would you tell him to go to the gym? Because as much as that is the obvious fix, as soon as you go to the gym, you're forever small. I remember walking into the UP gym in London back when we had people like Chester McGuire, it was like 120 kilos lean. And my first photo shoot there, I was like, well, I'm not going to be the biggest, so I can better damn sure be the leanest. And I got peeled because of that. And I, I probably, I felt smaller ever since that moment. You know, like, I'm more okay with it now. My priorities in life have changed. But, like, do you think that's how, taking your question back on this head, do you think the work you've done through has helped you get through that? Um, if... If someone was to come to me, if younger me was to come to me now, I would just want to have the conversation. I just want to dig and ask them or ask deeper questions. Because I wouldn't also want to take away training and like the pursuit of building muscle from yeah. someone. But if if the building muscle is with the goal of removing the fear and insecurities, it's probably not gonna happen. Mm-hmm. It might actually just feed the insecurities even more. So I think, you know, exposing someone to the conversations and the deeper questions and hopefully allow them to figure out why it is that they're really feeling like maybe the muscle it's not actually about the muscle it's just it's a confident issue and how else can we build confidence you know how else you know where else do you get your worth from is it just by the way you look or is it your personality is it, is it your lovingness is it your trust you know there's so many other things I think I think people like me younger versions of me put so much self-worth to the way that I looked hmm. and that's what led me to fitness and exercise because the better I looked, the, the, the more my self-worth was. Yeah. And, and for so many years, that created a really toxic relationship with the way that I looked because it meant that if I wasn't looking good, and that meant if I had a cheeseburger and a few beers on a Sunday, which meant Monday I wasn't looking good, all my self-worth was gone. Yeah. didn't matter how good of a coach I was, how nice of a person I was, I needed to do anything to get back to the lean head from four days ago because then I'm a better person. I, lo- I love the answer when you spoke to your younger self, you were just would ask more questions. Because mm-hmm. I did an episode recently with my co-host talking about our biggest success and biggest failures. And I found it a really difficult challenge. You these are the big life-defining moments that you stick out in your head. And actually it was hard because every failure that I've had, I, ca- I will attribute some level of success to it in the aftermath. So I always think it's like saying, what would you tell your 19 year old self? Like, Nothing. Because if I didn't do things the way I did things, there's probably so many different things that, that would have happened. I may not have been here in Hong Kong now. I may have not have gone into the mentorship side. I may have not have found this love for coaching, training, and mentoring. I may have not have my amazing fiance. Like, I think you have to go through these moments. And there's a great phrase I heard that you choose your regrets. You don't get to not have any regrets. You choose which ones you have. So like having this ability to kind of go, do you know what? No, I don't regret any of that. This has got me where I am here. And I don't know where my life could be without it. I think, I think it takes a certain mindset for someone to have that reflection. And I totally agree. I've always said I wouldn't change a thing because I wouldn't be where I am right now and I love who I am and where I am. But that takes a certain mindset in a human being to love who they are and what they're doing. Um, you know, someone who perhaps has more of a victim mindset um, or perhaps you know, sees life like a glass half empty. You know, there's so many analogies that all say the same thing. Positive mindset, you know, negative mindset. It's all kind of the same thing, I think. The person who probably sits on the opposite end of the spectrum from us would probably sit there and think there's a hundred things they'd rather change because mm. it would make life better, whatever you feel a bit like. You don't know that for so long. You, you, you could have gone the other way. You're like, that's the thing. It's like, it, it, have you ever seen the film Sliding Doors? No. There's this great film, I think it's Gwyneth Paltrow, um, where she, they, they, they have this instance where she tries to get to a tube and they have one scenario where she just makes it and one scenario where she just doesn't. And now that seemingly small thing mm-hmm. completely changed the concept of our life. And the good story ended up bad and the bad story ended up good. Yes. So it's, it's really interesting how, like, you don't know where your life's going to go. So I, and again, this is a lot of self-work and reflection, both via therapy and both via myself. If, of looking back at stuff, like, I try not to think too much about what I would change. Because I can't, I can't do anything about anything. So I, I could, all I can do is start looking forward and moving on to it. Yeah. So going on to the bit that I think that we are going to nerd out on. And... The thing I'm always quite excited about, I know from the, the logo on your shirt, the process programming, you're as much of a programming nerd as I am, but in very, very different fields. Tell me a little bit about 
why you decided to open up a CrossFit gym of all things. Because your story you just said was bodybuilding. Mm -hmm. And you said about athletics. And I know you spoke about being a broken athlete. Yeah. How did that become CrossFit? Yeah, good question. <clears throat> so the transition happened when, okay, so Coastal Fitness early days, when we first started, it was just, I was just a one man band. Mm -hmm. And my, the way that I would coach my clients would be very, very progressive, very structured, very periodized, um, you know, upper lower body splits, um, you know, most complex exercises first, most newly demanding exercises first, exercise get done, all the classic principles mm -hmm. of periodization that I think we both agree on, mm -hmm. that we probably learned from the Paula Quinn-esque era. Um, and that was actually how I shot a lot of my training as well. You know, as a professional rugby player, our strength and conditioning coach on the national team was a Paula Quinn coach as well, and he was awesome. And so I spent a lot of time in the gym because I had so many injuries. It was very, very broken. I spent a lot of time in the gym just shooting the shit with him. And I was very interested in the training, training process. So every time I would break and I get an operation, I'd be like, right, what's the next nine months going to look like? How are we going to do this? And I would like nerd out. I questioned, questioned him a lot. I'd be like, I want to know exactly why you prescribe this exercise. Why is this program a progression on for the last one? And so I learned a lot just through that experience. Um, now, towards the end of my career, uh, one of our colleagues here at Ghost Fitness had started doing CrossFit. And this guy was a skinny dude. He was, uh, he listens to his podcast as well, so sorry for us, I'll give him the name. Um, <laughs> but you know, he was like, he was 69 kilograms. He had a lot of insecurities about the way he looked. He'd been work lifting weights, but not getting much results. And he decided one day, he didn't really have a sport this time. He played a bit of football, but he wasn't pursuing it to a high level. The rest of our coaches were all playing high level sports still. And so strength conditioning was a means to, to facilitate the sport. And so he didn't have this sport, so he was like, I want to try something new. So he goes into CrossFit.com and starts doing his CrossFit workouts. And, you know, the, the, the purest in me was watching him, looking at the methodology, being like, this doesn't make any sense at all. This is like constantly varied, random things that you're not qualified to be doing. Everything's done with intensity. Um, but in the six months that he did it, he got jacked. And he got shredded. And this is a guy who'd already been lifting weights for five, six years. A very, very hard gainer. Not very metabolically flexible. Wasn't building muscle. And suddenly, like, his body transformed. Like, he went, he put on, he put on a lot of weight. Now, of course, there were a lot of things that were like lifestyle and nutrition that we weren't really thinking about back then. We just thought he started CrossFit and look at him, he's jacked. So it just spiked a bit of interest in me. Um, so whilst, you know, myself and Ant, you know, who's now, you know, a very high-level CrossFitter, we had programs to follow the national team. We would squeeze in CrossFit sessions. So we'd join, join our colleague and do, and it was really just metabolic conditioning. Mm -hmm. um, but the, you throw in some Olympic lifting, throw in some kettlebells, throw in a lot of burpees, throw in sleds and prowlers up. Kind of fun stuff, right? Mm -hmm. It was just different. It, I like the non-structured side to it because I've done so much structure for so long. The, the first thing we disagree on, burpees being called fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I actually quite like a burpee, still do, really. Um, so... It just, it just piqued my interest, right? I was just interested. And it, to be honest, I wasn't love it. Most people want to talk about CrossFit. They say, oh, I did my first workout. It messed me up when I fell in love. I'm like, I did my first workout, and I thought the training methodology was so dumb. It was so stupid. It didn't make any sense. So in 2010, CrossFit uh, come to Asia. They were on their very first ever level one. And so my friend goes, my colleague goes, do you want to go do the level one? And I was like, I actually do want to go do the level one because I have a million questions that I can't find answers to right now. Many, many concepts on programming didn't understand the way that they lay it all out. So yeah, I'd love to go and just, out of interest, find out what it's all about. Went to level one, asked all my questions, didn't get any answers, right? So the questions on, you know, like even, even respecting the strength continuum. Like I feel like we were taught straight away, the way you structure training, even for a beginner, is you go, you either do five by fives, seven by threes, or you build to a max. I'm like, what about the person that doesn't have motor control of movement? For the person who doesn't have strength endurance, what the person who you know, has never done a hypertrophy phase, like how can we just go to one rep maxes? No, didn't have any answers. So I kind of left the level one with more questions than answers, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Felt very unsatisfied about it, but was still interested in just playing around with it because it was fun. I was doing it with my friends, it was something different. My interest in rugby at this point was kind of like on the downfall. Uh, I just wanted to do something different than just split squats, hamstring curls, you know, like waiting. You know, I just wanted to different, just do different things at this point. And then the, the, the massive light bulb moment for me at CrossFit was coming across a guy called James Fitzgerald, 
who started this, his certification program is now called OPEX, and it's probably the gold standard when it comes to uh, coaching education in the sport of CrossFit. He calls it mixed modal fitness. That's his his way to like basically say it's CrossFit, but it's not CrossFit. Anyway, James's story was that he was a part of the Polymer Institute, so he was a strength and conditioning coach who was very, very, very smart, working with high-level American footballers, the soccer players. I say soccer because he was a soccer. Old <laughs> um, he was a professional athlete himself. He won, he won or podium the first CrossFit Games, and he basically fell out of love with CrossFit. He won the games and was like, "This is just dumb. Then there's no systems, there's no structure." Very much like me, he'd come from a structured background and he'd come into the sport just chaos and constant there. It didn't make sense of it. So he then set out to create methods for the madness. Mm -hmm. So he basically took classic scientific principles of strength and conditioning and just simply applied it to the sport of CrossFit. So he started talking about periodization, he started talking about micro cycles, he started talking about structural balance, like single leg exercises, like you can't just squat to get better at squatting. You know, he was having all these conversations, he was talking about energy systems, so he like worked with the endurance crowd and taking concepts on of how to peak for a marathon and apply it to the sport of CrossFit. There's no difference, it's just the modalities are changing now. <clears throat> and I came across his certification program and I was like, this is it, this finally makes sense. So I'd been there scratching my head for so long, being like, I just I don't understand how the hell I'd even sit down to start writing a training progression. And Ant, my brother, you know, he, he was clearly going to be good at the sport already. He asked me, he said, right, he was the first coach, he didn't have a coach, he said, Ed, can you program for me the CrossFit? And I was kind of like, man, I back myself as a coach, but I don't even have no idea where to start with this. So I tried to coach him for a while, and I just said to him, I was like, I think I'm doing you a disservice. I don't know enough about this sport, and I can't figure out a way to be systematic like, mm -hmm. I, like I have been for so long. So I ended up doing the certification, and it was just speaking to me. It was like, ah, okay, this totally makes sense. Like, now I can write intelligent training progressions that just makes sense and, it, and it's because I had all that background in strength conditioning that it just made sense because I then you know I was telling the world about OPEX I'm like okay you need to not don't just do the level one like go deep down this stuff and I saw so many people do the OPEX certification come out it was just as lost as they were going into it I was just lucky that I had all that background before was able to just understand what does a sport require and now just apply it to the methodology mm -hmm. the process so so essentially what happened then was when I started to understand the methodology and find a way to make it progressive, to make it make sense in my eyes, I then started playing around with some of my clients. Now, I wasn't programming CrossFit to try and get people to CrossFit games. I was just starting to implement more mixed modal elements. So it was like, more from a conditioning standpoint, playing around with just different things, teaching them skills, things they hadn't done in the past, and people were just loving it. I was seeing massive progress in my own journey at this point in time. And we were running a group program Outdoors, free of charge. We had like 300 people we were training every week out in the Happy Valley pitches in the schools. We were just driving around and we'd be running these massive group sessions. And then we basically bought a ton of fake TRXs from Taobao. Um, we bought loads of sandbags. We had loads of kettlebells. And we would just basically start programming like we would call them wads. But essentially, like the session would always start with some strength work as much as we could with the equipment that we had. And then we'd do some conditioning work. So it was kind of like a watered down variation of what most people at that time would call CrossFit. And it was really fun, and people were loving it. It was safe, like we weren't able to load people more than a 30 kilogram kettlebell. So like no one was getting injured. Um, people were loving the variety of it. And then, you know, after a couple of years of experimentation, the group stuff with individual clients and our own training, getting more and more interesting, and me getting fully more and more out of love of rugby, we were like, why don't we open a gym? Mm. But when we opened up a gym, we never called ourselves CrossFit gym. So our name straight away was Coastal Fitness. We weren't CrossFit Coastal. And the reason for that was we didn't want to fully just identify as a CrossFit gym. Because, you know, personal training was our bread and butter. And most of our clients were just general pop, looking to be fitter, healthier, faster, build muscle, you know, the type of thing. So we didn't go down the CrossFit route. Essentially, we were the second affiliated CrossFit gym in Hong Kong. And I think just straight away, people saw we were just doing things differently. You know, we weren't just trying to mess people up. We were trying writing training blocks. We were educating people what the training cycles were. We created multiple training groups straight away. So it wasn't just one workout a day. Everyone do it. We'll scale you up and scale you down. It was like, no, you're going to be in this group because your ability level is here and your goals are here. You're going to be in this group. You're going to be in this group. So we did loads of things that were very different. And I don't think anyone else was really doing it at the time. And again, like, I, 
I, I lean back on all of my education background from before um, to know that this is the way we've got to do it. We mm -hmm. can't just have one workout, and we can't make someone, I can't make my mum snatch. I can't be doing ring muscle, trying to teach my mum a ring muscle up, like that's not what she wants. I can't be put my mum upside down on a wall doing handstand push-ups. And I, I used my mum as an example because she was one of my first members. Mm -hmm. And it was good for me to have her there because it was like, what does my mum really need? Yes. And why is she actually here? She's not here because she wants to get to the CrossFit game, which I think is the biggest mistake most CrossFit gyms do. They look at what's programmed at the games, the sexy stuff on YouTube, and they recreate that in their gyms. And I was like, my mum doesn't have any interest in that. How do I make this safe for her so she can enjoy the group environment, she can still get strength and conditioning, and this is supporting her life? And what do I need for her to do to excel in life? Well, she's got to be strong. She's got to build muscle. She needs to know how to use her body to move through various planes of movement. And I want to have a basic aerobic system. Mm. And so as long as I take those bases, I can do it. What do you think most people come to coasting for? Performance or body composition? I would say body composition is very low down on the priority list. I don't think me, people come saying explicitly they want body composition, but I think most people are coming here because they, they want to be fitter, they want to be healthier. I think that's really the overarching goal. I think a lot of people have come here having done things like transformations, they've played sports, um, they've tried maybe hit in their 45s and boot campy style things, and now they're ready they're at a stage where they're ready to make a big commitment to their health and wellness. So that means like they're ready to train four to five times a week. I would say fitness and health and wellness isn't probably their top three priorities in their life. It's mm. kind of things they think about all the time. But now, you know, we have our biggest in our within our what most people would look at as our CrossFit program. Our biggest group is our Live program, which is kind of like our first entry level program. And most of those people don't even watch CrossFit games. Like they don't even know what the CrossFit games are. Yeah. They've come here because they want to get stronger, they want to get fitter, they want to be in the group environment. Um, they want to learn new things and challenge themselves and be a part of like, you know, those new games of learning something new, but they, they don't sit and watch the CrossFit Games. They, don't, they couldn't tell you what the CrossFit Games last year. Probably didn't even know that Ant competed in the CrossFit Games once. And that's just kind of like the evolution of where our clientele is moving to now. Yeah. Um, with that said, you know, we obviously have a lot of people who have been doing CrossFit for a long time. Perhaps they've been at another gym in Hong Kong or they've been at another gym overseas, they've just moved to Hong Kong. And they are they have chosen CrossFit as their sport. So in the same way that I chose rugby, you know, this is their thing now, like, this is what they love. And so that's a massive difference as well, you know, they made the choice to make this a sport. Yeah. And the moment you make this a sport, you're now saying, okay, that means you've got to accept that injury, you know, potentially burnout, not feeling good all the time, that's going to be a part of the process. Because if you want to be an athlete and compete in competitions a few times a year, then that's... That's the, um, that's the cost of entry. Yeah. And you need to be aware of that. Now, for everyone else who doesn't have an interest in that side of things, then I want you to feel good. Like, this should be supporting your life and not take away from it. Like, this should be allowing you to be a better dad or a better businessman and allowing you to achieve your aesthetic goals and allowing you to achieve your aerobic goal, whatever they are. You know, but sport is not everything for you. So it's really important we've got to make that distinct, that distinguish that difference for people when they come in. And for some people, they come in, they're like, oh, I really want to do that thing I saw on YouTube. Uh, you know, which is someone doing handstand walks and muscle-ups. And it's like, okay, awesome. Why do you want to do that? I don't know, I just think it looks really cool. And then that's our job to then get down to the nuts and bolts of like, you know, what do you really want? Yeah. And actually, it's walking on your hands. Does that really align with you wanting to live longer and prosper? Mm. Maybe it doesn't. Good Star Trek reference. Uh, they, but I think it's really interesting, like, when, when we look at, we, we initially looked at this as, like, cross versus bodybuilding. Yeah. But I think general population training in general is, is, a, is a totally different training camp in its own. Because if we look at, if we look at, say, I was say to do from, like, powerless to the bodybuilder. You know, the bodybuilder, you probably want to get stronger, but he doesn't really care as long as you look better at the end of the process. Yeah. The, the, the powerless or the performance guy probably would like to be, you know, like, um, be bigger and look a bit better, but... Doesn't care as long as more load goes in the bar. And while most gen pop clients are probably more towards the bodybuilder in terms of what their goals align, we've got to think of now these people, as you said, it's not their top two priorities. And if they don't see strength progressions, or if they're not mentally and physically engaged in the training, they're going to fall into a box of donuts, feeling like, what's the point? And hit, hit the effort button. Yeah. Right? So I think it's interesting. So fine, and this is why I thought this conversation can be really interesting. Because it's CrossFit allows this avenue of like, it's gone, it's done what a lot of optimal strength and conditioning and bodybuilding coaches have done and like puts the fun back into it. Not saying that bodybuilding isn't fun, but bodybuilding is fun for bodybuilders. Yeah. And like, where is this line between 
what the client wants, what they need, and where's that middle ground. So like going to like this system itself, you see all the horror stories with CrossFit, right? Like yeah. the act, act, you know, people getting injured from actual and passive range of motion issues not managing fatigue well because it's, it's not, almost like it's written by a guy with Tourette's and he said it's random, right? <laughs> so like, how do you program differently to work around people's different active and passive ranges? Inability to squat bench dead with overhead press. Mm. You know, how do you make that different? And how, also, how do you make that different in a group program as well? Because that's yeah. where I suppose the challenge is. Yeah, so <clears throat> how we do it here is <clears throat> Even our group programs have a one-on-one -on -one assessment that people have to go through. So I would say that our barriers to entry to join our group program is pretty high. Most people love group training because it's got really low barriers to entry. They can just walk in and get a group session. And that's not what we're doing. So our assessment protocol, when someone first comes in and says, I want to be a part of the perform compete program, that's our three different levels. They have to go through one-on-one -on -one assessment. They actually have to pass the assessment. So what we're assessing there is exactly like you said, passive and active ranges. Can someone move into a hip below parallel squat without any movement, like drastic movement deficiencies? Can someone put both arms over their head passively and loaded? Um, does someone able to hang off a barbell, uh, hang off a pull-up bar for 30 seconds, like basic level strength? Can someone perform eight split squats in one leg and perform eight split squats in the other leg? Can someone hold themselves in a front plank position on their hand supported for 30 seconds? Can someone support themselves in like a Sorensen hold or a GHD for 30 seconds? Like very basic things, but what that immediately qualifies the individual to do is if I know that they can perform a good looking air squat and they have minimal imbalance between right to left leg and they can place their, uh, place their, their hands over their head without lumbar extension and potentially putting their spine at risk, then I know with intelligent, smart loading that this athlete is going to be safe. Here's a, here's a product question I have on that because yeah. it's something I've always battled with going down the, the RTS sort of world and going down the polygons world. Right? And the problem is, everyone should be able to squat as the grass because they use the baby analogy for getting the babies have overly gigantic heads and never move away from the centre of mass. But you also got the, you, the, the sometimes the exercise mechanic world has to wrap people in a bubble wrap and go, well, it could be structured, we don't have an x ray, let's just work around it. Yeah. Where is this middle ground with you? Like, well, obviously, some of these things a dead hang, uh, plank position, yes, eight split squats, everyone could probably do that. Yeah. But the below tower, people squat. actually can't. Yeah, what in terms of like never because of structure? Just to, no, just because, oh sorry, just don't have the base level strength. Yeah, you so, but like, yes, they, but they could be trained to do right, that. Gotcha, yeah. Like, with regards to like, say, a below power yeah. squat of being able to have a loaded overhead position, yeah. stacked, ribcage pelvis, is that something that people reckon most people can do, mm. regardless of anything? I would say that we probably pass about 70% of our assessments. Mm. So 30% actually we say, Unfortunately, like we're not right now at a place where we can move you in to the group class program because it's just going to be unsafe. Yeah. And you're, just, you're just not going to get the progressions that you're coming here for. So we obviously got to offer those people solutions. So yeah. we say, you know, either we can get there by one-on-one -on -one coaching or perhaps you have this other class that's, you know, doesn't have those requirements and you can perhaps do kind of like a light version of it. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, in terms of, I mean, I'll put my hand up and say straight away, like, I can't do a master grass squat. I've mm -hmm. never been able to do a master grass squat. Uh, and then, you know, having a bunch of knee injuries, uh, where I've got you know a lot of bone on bone now, like, I'm never going to be able to get exactly bone spurs, spurs maybe exactly. long femurs, exactly. all sorts of and I have, yeah, and long femurs. So I've got a lot of things working against me in the squatting space. But I guess you know a requirement of the sport of CrossFit, and even though our live program isn't really preparing people for the sport, you know there is a movement standard requirement where we want people's hips below parallel. Um, now if people are like kind of on that borderline, which is basically what I am, and we're totally fine. What we're really looking for is like. Can we have someone tracking, like squatting with these tracking their toes mm. without you know aggressive lumbar flexion and be safe to put a barbell on their back and know that they're not going to be injuring themselves? That's really what we're looking for. And if someone can get asked the grass, then awesome, like you're going to have probably zero issues in the long term. And if someone's kind of on that borderline where potentially there's some movement conversation happening, we're going to have that conversation with them to say, like, you know, it's not the be all and end all to be able to squat ask the grass, but it should be within your interest to cultivate as much range of motion as you have, control that range of motion, because I think you're just going to bulletproof yourself in the future. And I think, kind of going back to what you were saying before, which is, you know, what are people coming for? I think a lot of people enter a process gym because they're kind of like, they're looking for function, right? They want to explore what their body can do now. Uh, you know, and I very much came from like, 
an aesthetic world where I didn't give a shit about function. And then I kind of went to like, now the complete opposite end of the spectrum where I care a lot about function. I want to see what my body can do from like mobility, from a strength perspective, from an aerobic or an energy system perspective. I want to really challenge what it can do. But I'm also not going to lie and say that I'm still kind of stuck between, I'm wanting to challenge the function of what my body can do, but I still care about body composition. Mm. And I would say that most people in the process space are probably in that same boat. You know, they may say that they all they care about is performance and function, but I think a lot of people have something that is body composition related. So I mean, this is a hard conversation I have with a lot of high level athletes who say, I just want to be the best crossfitter I want that I can potentially be, and I want to make it to the crossfit games. And based on the standards of what an athlete at their level is, they're light. You're 10 kg lighter than what the average elite level crossfitter is. Now, would you be willing to put on 10 kilograms? to perhaps bring you up to a standard to allow you to be more competitive in sport? And often the answer is no. And so that's straight away where you're like, okay, so perhaps performance isn't your only goal. And that's totally fine. It's totally fine if not, if you want to hold on to having a six pack and trying to be as athletic as possible with a six pack, then that's great. Let's work towards that goal, but as long as we're clear on it. Yeah. You know, but if you're saying that all you care about is to be the best athlete you can, but then you're not willing to let go of the way that you look, well then it's not a conversation. How do you shift people with your people who just want to look better, feel better, and maybe the people that are coming in for maybe more body composition goals? One of the biggest things, this is, this is interesting from, from my perspective, my coaching going into somebody who maybe focuses more on the performance side of this compared to the body composition side of this. A lot of people will finish fatness goals with a goal in their head because they feel they should to build muscle. And what I realise is most people don't actually want to build muscle as much as they say they want to build muscle because yeah. they don't want to risk losing their abs in the process of doing it. And I find that sometimes, and this is where the mechanics problem working around, you know, structure, and it has its limits. I think it's sometimes better to find the right squat for somebody rather than saying don't squat. I went through that for years. Squatting is not for you. Do hat squats, do pendulum, do split squats. Yeah. I'm like, awesome. And if my only goal in life was like, never to run a business, never have kids, never do anything else in life, it was just my only goal was the biggest squats, probably good advice. Yeah. But after a while, that kind of training becomes a little bit less fun. Yeah. But for that person who's, coming out of that diet, and now you're trying to get them to shift over to a more performance mindset, because muscle building takes a lot longer, and it's a much slower process, and you can't be fixated on the scale or the way you look. How would you help people make that shift in terms of mindset to go with that performance? Yeah, I mean, ultimately, it's not my decision to make, is it? Mm. And I think that's a, the that's a hard thing as coaches. Um, you know, we can have our biases and the, and the lens that we love to look at training through. And perhaps we have our reputation of what we're able to do. I think sometimes we put that we put that onto the people that we're serving. And I think ultimately it's just again going back to asking the right questions and figuring out what that person really wants. Sometimes sometimes people actually don't know what they want. Like you said, like sometimes people say they want to build muscle, and then you get into the process of building muscle, and then you realise pretty quickly like this person actually doesn't yeah. really want muscle, you know. And so I think that the earlier you can get clarity on that just the small smooth savings the journey's going to be, and the easier, the easier that transition is going to be. Um, and I always say to people, I'm like, it's totally okay to have your biggest goal be something that's vanity related. And I always share my story. I'm like, I still care about the way I look. Like, I'm not going to sit here in line and just pretend it's all about how much I can squat and how much I can snatch and clean. Like, I love that stuff. But like, there are times where I've tried to get as strong as possible and I put on three or four kilograms and I actually look at myself in the mirror and I feel quite sad. And I'm like, I just don't want, I don't want to look like this. I'm not confident. I feel like it's affecting my worth as a coach. And this is crazy. This is somebody who thinks about this shit every single day. And these things still feed into my mind, you know? Mm. And so I think that's why I think conversations like this are so important. Like coaches like us, who are probably put on a pedestal to be like, you're the God that I want to achieve to do. I want to be able to do things like you can. So please let me work with you. For us to be vulnerable, and open to say that we have our insecurities, we have our struggles, it's totally okay if you have yours. The more honest you can be, perhaps we can actually help you, um, you know, like demystify or debug debug those things. I think that's a, that's a massive point for, for any coaches listening to this as well, is that people's priorities in life change. And while, like you said, like early on in your, your, your late teens and twenties, you were there to get bigger. Now, you still care about this stuff, but that focus has now got more on performance. Now, for me, I had a real hard time. Chris Williamson from Modern Wisdom calls it the menopause, right? Yeah. Right. You know, everyone's trying to be a bodybuilder in their twenties, and all of a sudden they start Brazilian Jiu Jitsu um, mm. in the thirties. 
But I hadn't talked about that I, 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 I so relate to that. It's that story of like, I spent my entirety of my 20s as a coach, head down, in a nappy box, working on programming, and in a basement. Didn't see the world, didn't do anything outside of that. And I just lived for work. And now I'm getting into my early 30s, like, there's other things in life that I want to do. And, but to do that, I've almost got to let go of my body a little bit because I've got to understand that training isn't the only priority in my life anymore. I've got three, four more months in, in Hong Kong before I even go back to the UK. I'm going to enjoy all the food that's here. But I've also got a wedding in August, and I don't want to look bad in the wedding photos. So you, everyone has these competing priorities. And I think as a coach, it's sometimes harder to have these moments because it's like, oh, I can't let go of this. I need to be perfect because if my, my client sees me with a sandwich, then they're like, I'm not living practicing my preach. Like, as long as you're not, one, as long as you've done it once in your life, doing what your client's supposed to do, whether that is being able to perform at a high level if you're performing performance coaches, or be shredded once if you're doing a fat loss goal, and as long as it doesn't get super sloppy, I think there needs to be less pressure on coaches, especially if they're good and they know what to do. And then it's funny, funny you say that, I mean, I resonate with everything you say, but it kind of comes back to, it comes back to your insecurity that brought you into coaching, right? I mean, it's, it's how much we think people care, and they actually don't. Do you know what I mean? It's, it actually, sometimes, I think my clients fucking love seeing me have a few drinks and like get sloppy in a weekend and like put a bit away because they're just like, he's human. I'll tell you a story about that. I had a client who lost uh, 35 kilos a while back, right? And she lost the first five, 10 pretty easily. And then she was like struggling for a while. Hitting that thing that all clients get, that little diet limbo, where the thing that motivates you, I always talk about motivation with clients. And it's like, sometimes for a push motivation, a pull motivation. So initially, people need a push motivation. They're pushing away from something that makes them feel miserable. I look in the mirror every day, I don't like the way I look. I like the comments of my friends. I don't like being the butt of the joke, like being the small guy. Like, that's the thing that gets you started. And then there's a middle ground, it's like, well, I don't dislike how I look anymore, but that's a lot of work. And now that motivation to put your way isn't there. So you need to pull them towards something exciting. This is where a holiday, a photo shoot, or something that just makes the day valuable to drive them through that middle point. And she was there, and I was going through a um, photo shoot prep at the time and really going for it. And I, I told her about the time I had a, my coach gave me a refeed and told me to go and have a Domino's pizza. And she's like, well, you eat pizza? Like, of course I do. And she generally had this belief that I was just this different breed of person who just can't wait for my next chicken and broccoli fix and every session is beast mode. I'm like, no, sometimes I want to skip the gym. Sometimes I have donut, beers, pizza. And I told her about how my parents used to own pubs. And I'm like, all of a sudden she starts sticking to a diet mode because it was now believable to her. It's not looking at this guy on Instagram and going, wow, he looks like he's got a good body, but my life's different. No, our lives are exactly the same. We just know how to, temporarily at least, delay gratification for a bigger, bigger goal. And as you said, we're asking the right questions and tuning into that and setting expectations, which is what I think a lot of coaches don't do well enough. It's like saying, look, we want this, but this is what I expect of you. And one thing I, over the years I've got much more strict on is especially as I said, there's other parts of my life and I don't want to be attached to my WhatsApp all the time with every single person. So this is what you want, this is how long it's gonna take, and this is what I expect from you. Are you okay with that? And you know, I, I, I sense hesitation. So it's not like, it is, yeah, easy, fantastic, let's go. It is, yeah, okay, what makes you hesitant? Oh, I, I've got my brother's birthday next week, I've got this the week after, and I'm going on a holiday to Bangkok. But, okay, how about we aim for half percent of our body weight per week? And we, it'll take a bit longer, but we can work these things in. Yeah, sounds good. And I can tailor the expectations to their reaction. And I don't feel enough coaches do that. As you said, put their goals on people. To the point where they're pushing harder than they ever really wanted to do. Or they're shooting for a goal and they don't understand the work. It's, hey, my personal trainer now, my abs are income. Like a deliverer. And that's just how it works. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, we always say that if something is not a 9 out of 10, and then a 9 out of 10, yes, I can do it, then they do it. Mm. You know, and then that's what I'm always looking for. You know, I love the idea that you're just talking about, like, you know, setting up a roadmap. This is where you are. This is where you can get to. Here's my honest expert opinion of what I think is going to need to be done to in order to achieve that. Now tell me, is that 9 out of 10? And if they're just like, mm, I think it's more like a 7. All right, let's trip something back. Now how's that sound? Mm, maybe an 8. Okay, let's trip something back. And at the end of the day, and then, and then, this is obviously very case dependent. This is why coaching is so individualized, right? Because if you've got someone and you've got 12 week transformation that they've signed up for, you've got 12 weeks. And like that's a very different story to the person who's coming to you and saying, I want a lifetime of change. You know, I want to be playing with my grandkids, I want the next I want to be doing this for the next 20 years. And that person, so that person's got a 12 week transformation. 
and they go, that's not a 9 out of 10, that's a 6 out of 10. Okay, cool, we can strip something back, but you realise this might not be done in 12 years, and I think people are scared to have that conversation, saying, well, you're not going to get that. But I had one guy who was online to me once, he was like, he, he looked like a, like a skinny arm just a bit like weird Andy Anthony, with a bigger beard. <laughs> yeah, I know that name and, so he, and he sent me a picture of Terry Crews and what he wanted to look like. Now, this taught me a lot about setting expectations because there's a lot of things I can't do. I can't make him black. So, like, I, I had to have that conversation. And what I've learned, so especially this works great if you have a portfolio of results or a gym with a transformation wall. So, if you want to look like a certain after photo, do you look like before? Not necessarily in terms of body fat, although that might mean you can get there but it takes longer. Do you have similar bone structure, similar shoulder width, your hip widths? And if you don't look like that before, let's find an after before you do look like. Even that's so hard though, isn't it? Yeah. Because there's so much more, there's so often so much more context that goes into it before and after. And I think before and after is like genius marketing to attach right into like, into the, into the emotions of the human beings. Like that is a cheap way I could do it. But, you know, I just guess for like the people out there, like you just never know. And you say a 20 week result, right? People go, oh, that? that's no time at all. What can I do in six months? But they don't think that's 20 weeks of days. Yeah. And you've got to make sure you're doing this all of the days. So people, she see the quick. They don't see the work it goes into make that quick. They don't see what well, week one to week two looks like. Week two to week three, week one to week four. They see week one to week twenty. It can also be someone like you, you know, who's the big strong guy, who's worked out his whole life, has done some serious shreds, has gone to crazy levels of leanness. He decided to slop off for three months and take this before photo that looked like you were just overweight and like you'd never trained in your life. And you know, your, that 12 week transformation for you is trained his whole life. You took three months off and completely different. To the person who looks exactly the same as you, who's never trained in their life, who's ain't going to transform. And I've done that by accident. Yeah. <laughs> Not deliberately, yeah. Yeah. fell into a pizza box. But you know, like, yeah, it, it, exactly that. It, but it, I, I had one of my old coaches share one of my transformation photos recently. And, like, while it was definitely the best shape I've ever been in in my life, and, I, you know, it's something that I might hire this guy again to get me a shape for my wedding, but I, I look at the results and go, well, that's not necessarily what even I could achieve now with different priorities, different injuries, different niggles, different limitations, different responsibilities, let alone what somebody else can do. So it's tricky, you've got to have that perspective, but I do, I'd rather have a bit of grey area and set expectations for the clients so they know what they need to do, rather than being like, yeah, yeah, we'll do that, and having no idea what you're about to do. Yeah, 